Good afternoon and welcome all to this session uh, regarding uh, soil health and mitigating climate change. Uh, this session is organized by the Baltic Sea Action Group and m my name is Elisa Vainio. I will be the chair of the session today and I come from the, from the BSAG, Baltic Sea Action Group. Uh, and uh, we have time for questions after each presentation, so please be active also in the audience. And you can also ask questions online, so I can try to pick them up from the chat. Uh, and yes, so don't hesitate to ask. We have, we have time for some questions after each presentation. And then we have also coffee break in between, where you can discuss uh, with the speakers. But uh, without any further delay, I will invite our first speaker here. Our first speaker is Gusten Brodin, uh, coming from Sweden, from Milio Mathematik, uh, and he is going to present uh, their project, Svensk Kolin Lagring. Uh, yes, so go ahead, Gusten. Thank you. Yes. Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah? So my name is Gusten and I'm here to represent uh, Svensk Kolinlagring and Miljömatematik. And um, just as an <laughs> introduction, I, I come from physical geography with a speciality in agricultural soils. Um, so as a short background of the project, uh, we are a company called Miljömatematik with a stated mission to transform the food system and contribute to food as a solution to thriving societies within the planetary boundaries. And we are a, a consultancy agency based in Malmö in Sweden, a not-for-profit organization that works quite broadly with things related to food and sustainability. And this project, Svensk Kolinlagging, is one, it's, uh, one of them, uh, at, for the moment, the largest by far. And Svensk Kolinlagring is an initiative started some years ago and with a stated mission of to design a win-win-win solution to reverse climate change, increase soil carbon content and fertility, conserve and create ecosystem services and thereby improve yields and profits for Swedish farms. So <laughs> a quite small task uh, or not. And I think some of you might be familiar with this concept. It's called the planetary boundaries. And this is one of our main bases for how we work with these questions. Um, and this is also why we are working. Uh, because we have all these um, issues globally and that we have to, and all, in, within all these, we have to be inside a safe operating space to be able to sustain what we are doing. And the interesting thing with agriculture is that it covers nearly all of these to some extent. And uh, for example, the nitrogen and phosphorus is almost everything is related to agriculture, while the climate gases is, is approximately 25%. So while we are having this mindset when we work, uh, and when we communicate with our partners, we are also using carbon as a proxy for all these. Because carbon is in soils is uh, one, one uh, <laughs> variable that can say a lot of things about the state of the soil. And in, in very general terms, the more carbon, the better everything. Um, so our pilot program started, uh, we started the initiative in uh, late 2018. And 2020, we had a first pilot round uh, for, with 14 farms. And then uh, we had a second pilot round, now 2021, 2022, where we increased the farms to 40 pilot farms, covering 900 hectares in total. And we have uh, 11 development partners that mainly are contribu contributing with uh, economic uh, funds for, that are transferred to the farmers so that, that they can have the possibility to try these things that we want them to try. We are also working closely with several different universities, uh, four universities and eight different research collaborations. Uh, we have uh, started a community for our farmers where we both have uh, um, 
what do you call it, a forum where they can meet and ex exchange ideas, but also organize seminars and field trips and so. We have also, together with both our farmers and uh, our researchers, developed future scenarios. Um, how do you say it? Ways of thinking of Swedish agriculture in the future. And that has actually just been published, uh, our first uh, scientific paper from that. And we're also working uh, with uh, MRV, uh, which is measurement reporting verification system uh, in specific for the Nordic countries. So, uh, yeah, I can say on this as well, that the main thing is uh, we funnel money from food sector to, so that, that they can pay a more full, fuller price for the product so that the farmer uh, has the economic feasibility to try and incorporate methods that are better for the soil. And at the farms we test a lot of things. We test our business models, we test our technical platform where the farmer manages the fields and uh, um, receive contracts and receive payments. Uh, we build a lot of knowledge and uh, co-create um, both knowledge and networks. And, uh, but most importantly, we test principles for carbon sequestration. And uh, I think we will hear a lot about these uh, principles later today as well. So we'll uh, just list them here, uh, the ones we are working mainly with. And here you can also see where our fields are located. It's mainly in the southwest and in a line there, and that is, uh, for those of you not too familiar with Sweden, that is mm, where most of our arable land is as well. But we also have one, uh, our father, the one in the north is uh, near Umeå. And together with our researchers, we identify potential research needs and collaborations and see what question arises when we start to pay farmers for more ecosystem services. We also evaluate pilot the, how well it goes and uh, attach to other initiatives, both in Sweden and globally. We are also um, building up new intensive study sites together with the several universities. And here is some of our current collaborations, of which I want to mention Carbon Action here in Finland and BSAG, which is uh, the main reason why we are here today. So thank you for that. Our development partners uh, contribute by financing transition, but also by providing valuable feedback on our business models, our frameworks, and, uh, and our offers, both to them and to the farmers. They are also working within their company to spread knowledge about how sustainable agriculture can look and how it works and what, what is the problem with um, some, some types of agriculture. Yes. So now I want to talk about uh, just quantification for a bit because that is what I'm working <laughs> most with and also uh, um, yeah, the theme of the day. So we are working uh, with different tracks at the same time and one of the first and the most prioritized for us right now is to verify actions, verify implemented actions at farms. For example, how can we know with a certainty that a farmer has implemented cover crops and to which extent have them implemented and so on. Um, we're also working with uh, actual uh, carbon sequestration quantification uh, through remote sensing or models and uh, some sensors as well. And we're also working with how we can verify this, these models. How can we know that they are actually showing what is happening in the soil? And there we, all, we both work with uh, traditional soil sampling but also uh, are looking very into spectroscopy which is a really emerging technology for, uh, that enables more sampling to a, a way more cost-effective. And most importantly, we are doing these three things in the context, context of uh, Miljö Mathematik and Svensk Kålinlagings missions. 
So our mission is not to build our own model that fulfills every need and <laughs> provides a super exact answer. It is to have these tools so that we can enable a transformation of the food system. And here is a small timeline of what we are doing in regards to quantification. So since the project started, we have evaluated and looked into a lot of different models from across the globe um, related to soil carbon. Uh, and we are still doing that. We haven't found <laughs> our silver bullets yet. Um, but we're looking and hoping. And uh, it's, as I think you know, it's happening a lot in this uh, sector right now. Uh, during the autumn 2020, we did some uh, initial soil sampling, and mainly we wanted to see how does the workflow looks, how, who can sample, to which depth can sample, how does this, the lab affect the result, and the lab affects the results really much, <laughs> even if you send the same. So that was mainly due to pave the way for smoother sampling <laughs> in the future. And this winter we have been working with the uh, models for crop cycle identification and uh, diversity indices, mainly with uh, Stockholm University. And right now we are in the middle of uh, some initial field trials with these spectrometers. We have three different types. And uh, so right now we are gathering data on both uh, results and also how well they handle in field because it's one thing to have them at your desk, and another where it's uh, soil everywhere and no reception at the uh, phone. <laughs> mm. This autumn, we will continue to develop models and methods for V1, which is verification of actions. So how can we know if farmers have done what they are pledged to do? We also aim to be able to measure broadly for baseline for our, all our pilots farm. So also the pilot uh, project uh, ends this autumn and then afterwards that it, the goal is to move from project to a self-sufficient organization, which is also meant to be not for profit. These action bases we have two approaches that we are working with separately, and we are planning to keep them both at all in the future as well. And one is the action-based, where a farmer can say that, yeah, I want, to, I want to have cover crops, I want to do no-till, and I want to, yeah, so, something more. And then, uh, as long as we can follow up that, we can uh, say that, yeah, okay, this is approved. And here we r rely on science-based Chablon estimates of uh, carbon balances, and there we have quite solid uh, background to, to rely on. Uh, this is planned for already for autumn, and uh, and it also involves payment per hectare. Um, we also have a result-based uh, track, where it's where it relies on actual quantification of actual carbon sequestration. And that is uh, a bit trickier. Um, and that is planned within the next three years. And then it's payment per actual carbon instead. This is a small schematic of how we are thinking of these V1 and V2. So this V1 is verification of actions. And it relies heavily on remote sensing and also on qualitative data gathered from the farmers. Uh, with different uh, types of indices and, uh, sorry, um, also, uh, yeah, data gathered. Uh, so the green one here is a result in itself, but it's also uh, input for the V2, which is um, how we imagine um, the need of a model, so to speak that results in net kilo carbon per farm, but also in effects of actions per field and per farm. And uh, here we need to include uh, weather and uh, also farm greenhouse gas emissions to be able to provide a net uh, carbon budget. 
We're also having a small vision uh, of a V3, which is outside the scope of this project, but uh, an, an end goal. And that is to use these together with climate scenarios to be able to uh, recommend best practice and management uh, based on farm prerequisites and for further climate scenarios for that particular location. Um, I will just briefly talk about this a, a, little, a bit. This is from the initial soil sampling. Uh, in Sweden we have a grid, uh, which is uh, not official standard, but it's the one that most people use. Um, so it's one per hectare, and uh, we are all, in the fall we are following an FAO MRV. And that states we need to stratify the fields, so divide them into uh, corresponding stratas and sample there. Uh, so to, give, to be able to uh, have fewer samples, but also better samples. So we are working with an open science team in uh, uh, USA to do that. We also, uh, together with Stockholm University, um, looking into crop cycle and uh, trend lines over time. So this down here is one of our fields, which is, um, it doesn't show the trend line for the NDVI right now, but it's also increasing. And these three orange dots are soil organic carbon measurement from one of our partners done through remote sensing. Um, and almost all of this farm's field, at least, uh, it's, it has trend lines going upward in both variables. But for this technique, for example, relies on bare soil to be able to measure, and uh, that is one thing that we don't want uh, to promote, and uh, especially this farmer doesn't want to have in his farming system. So that is an issue. Um, we are working with several levels at once, and I've been talking a lot about these technical solutions in the top, and, but that is actually our smallest part of what we're doing. We are working with business models and policies and frameworks, and a lot with cultural values with all, all our partners. As it says in the picture, culture eats strategy for breakfast, so it's easy to come with a technical solution to a problem but it's harder to identify what the problem is. And uh, it's very easy to get uh, technical solutions and also funding for technical solutions, but the, it is in the bottom uh, where, it, where, it can, where you can get the most for money, so to speak. Um, I will just show you this to you. These are some part of a prototype uh, that the farmer, for the action-based, you need to have three of the four top, and then it's up to the farmer to decide how and to which, uh, how they want to implement them. And that is also in line with this pyramid, that we provide the, the criteria, and then they provide the solutions. Um, so the pilot is mainly building this prototype, and it's built around this flower, um, blood. <laughs> Petals, exactly. So I've been talking a lot about the topmost verifying V1, but we're also uh, working a lot with business models and uh, offers to companies and so, um, and the education. So these are the key takeaways. We haven't found our uh, good model yet. We need better ways of quantifying agricultural carbon sequestration that is based on and able to predict existing and emerging agricultural systems. And we need robust, transparent and sufficient MRVs to follow up on these. And to be able to foster change, we have to work with all these levels at once in the pyramid. And very importantly, we have to move in the, to the gen, from the generally wrong to the generally right not from the general wrong to the specifically wrong. For example, by providing an exact number for something that we don't really know. All while meeting the, our state admissions to transform the food system. And I just want to show one picture here from yesterday. And we are very happy that we have come here to Finland and seen new field trials of this. And it's, for example, the first point here, that we need better models and they are, need to be built on 
uh, better field trials. So that, is, that actually was shown to us yesterday, so we we're very happy with that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gusten, for a very interesting presentation and also a very important project that you have in Sweden. So, any questions from the audience? Maybe I will start. Sorry. Maybe I will start with the first question here. Uh, so, you mentioned uh, the future scenarios, uh, a new paper that yeah. just come out. So, could you tell any highlights or any like uh, about that um, and how the how the farmers see the future? Maybe. Yeah, it. Uh, one of the highlights is that the farmers envision um, way more diverse farms for themselves with uh, more integrated livestock and more integrated food production and also with a lot more humans on the farms, both working but also receiving from the community, for example, in education and, uh, and policymakers and tying them closer together. And, um, yeah. So more like a stakeholder involvement. Exactly, and a closer connection to, to the consumers, actually. Yes, exactly. I, I don't know if anyone likes the word stakeholder, I'm sorry yeah. about <laughs> that, but I meant everyone in, in sort of involved, so, but yeah, okay. Mm. Um, any questions from the audience at this point? Nina Hutia from the University of Helsinki. I was just uh, curious about your models. You told, told us that uh, you haven't decided yet which kind of models you're going to use. So are, are they going to be some kind of a system dynamic or optimization models or? Um, yeah, as w w we haven't decided. Uh, w we are mostly, I think that what we have worked with yet points towards some kind of um, uh, machine learning based model where we don't state the, um, uh, how do you call them, uh, how, how things work beforehand, but instead use these new Dark data sets to let the model find out how it works, and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's also, uh, as I know that Jari will talk about, it's we are we don't build our own models in that context, so we are hoping for <laughs> uh, that. For example, Carbon Action provides them to us. Uh, Alan Juan Niemi from Natural Resources, uh, Resource in, um, <laughs> sorry, Loke. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, because that I attended a conference, uh, Eurosoil Congress, and the French scientists say that they are disappointed with the results of measuring soil organic carbon, and they say that the results are quite disappointing and it takes about 50 years to get any relevant results to see any increase in soil organic carbon. So I would ask, how can you achieve in three years? Um, yes, for, for it, I have two answers, and one is that uh, we have seen uh, both uh, quite a uh, large research group that, uh, or studies that points to uh, that it can go really fast, not per one year, because it fluctuates with <laughs> weather and climate, but uh, way faster than 50 years. And also, uh, it, only the pilot runs for three years, and after that, when uh, the project migrates to an organization, it will be dependent on the contracts spanning longer years. Uh, so then uh, it, the contract is dependent on, for example, five or ten years um, undertakement. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move on. Uh, it's just time for the next presentation. And next we will have Jari Liski, a research professor and chief scientist from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And we move on to this carbon action, so what we do here in Finland, sort of similar uh, compared to the 
previous presentation. Go on, Jari. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Like the title says, I'm going to present the uh, verification method that for carbon sequestration in agricultural fields, which we have developed as a part of this carbon action. And what is carbon action? Carbon action is a, is a joint initiative between uh, farmers, businesses, and research to develop methods and, and generally to support the practicing of uh, regenerative agriculture, which is climate friendly and also biodiversity friendly and should provide like a secure yields also in the future conditions. So this initiative was started, that was Baltic Sea Action Group's idea uh, in 2017. Uh, that is when, when we started and uh, what is there on board now, 100 farmers are carrying out and like a are involved in this uh, action. I'm, I'm going to tell about the experiment that they're carrying out on their fields. Uh, we have 14 companies who are participating in the work on this platform. And uh, we have, uh, f uh, at the moment, 24 research projects there. So you can read more about Carbon Action on, the, on our the web pages, carbonaction.org. So now when I'm going to present this verification, I decided to take an approach that I'd rather give an overview of the components uh, and why we're developing a verification methodology that we're developing. And that will be then at the expense of the details that I can cover. But I've tried to include the uh, references and the links to the references and also web page addresses. So I think this material will be available after this conference so that you can, those who are interested can check the details later. But first, I'll start by sort of uh, inter introducing quite far, not from the ancient Romans, but quite far from, from introducing why we, why we have chosen this approach. So in addition to uh, that we need to decrease the uh, fossil carbon uh, dioxide emissions to the atmosphere very quickly, we, that's even not enough. We need to come up with new means to uh, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and how much is needed. The details of how much the exact number, it depends on varies from scenario to scenario, but what we are talking about, we are talking about something like 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide removals from the atmosphere each year. And then when you look at the uh, estimates at which methods we have available, and then also pay attention to the cost of these different methods, we see that all the methods that lie below the uh, price limit of $100 the ton of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere are somehow related to land ecosystems. And this purple, uh, or this pink uh, box there represents the possibilities estimated for soil carbon sequestration. So from these two slides, it follows that the, there will be a lot of soil carbon to quantify during the coming decades. And that uh, soil carbon to be quantified has a very high environmental and also economic value. So that is why our vision has been that we really have to use the, the best scientific measurement technologies and best uh, scientific modeling approaches and develop a methodology where, where it is not limited by kind of a computing uh, capacity. So that has been kind of our vision and that is, uh, that is what we're doing or trying to do at least. Yes, the central questions are that the, it's not only that how much carbon is sequestered, but now we are talking about additional carbon. So we need to increase the carbon sinks, not to rely on the existing ones, but to increase. So that is uh, how much of the uh, sequestered carbon is additional, a result of uh, more like a carbon farming practice. And uh, then it's also important to know that for how long this carbon stays in the soil. And then that's kind of the natural science result, but then we also need to develop a method that is compatible with different uh, applications like greenhouse gas inventories, life cycle analysis, so where we can then uh, use these natural science-based estimates. So from these questions, it, it follows that we need to uh, use different measurements, but we also need to, uh, need to uh, use models because, for example, estimating how much of the carbon is additional. It's very impractical to try to do that based on the soil samples or measurements only. And then, like one of our researchers said, that you cannot measure everything everywhere all the time. And especially, you cannot take measurements of the future yet. So that is why the, the use of the modeling, modeling is, is necessary. So the uh, scientific uh, community, uh, this is uh, from a paper of US uh, a few years back, and now the scientific community working in this field, in soil scientists and other related scientists, what they're proposing is that the kind of the vision uh, combines various measurements, modeling, and computing. And like 
based on this background and these kind of ideas, that is, uh, that, that's the reason why we have uh, why we are developing a methodology that we're developing right now. And when I'm talking about like we, I mean uh, the researchers and different research institutes and universities who are like, associated with Carbon Action and working in the various research projects that are part of Carbon Action. So with this uh, photo and graph, I try to illustrate the, the basic idea of our me uh, verification methodology. You say, see, see there in the middle in the top, there's, there's a, we have a, this kind of a IT platform, which is called Predictive Ecosystem Analyzer, PECAN is, is the acronym for that. That is a kind of a platform which is, which is uh, uh, developed in, in order to make it possible to code in different uh, simulation models. We were talking about in this discussion about different models, so that it makes it easier to, to use different models at the same time. And then it's, it's also a platform where you can uh, more easily than running the individual models, you can, you can bring in the input data that these models use. This platform also includes kind of data analysis routines, which can be used commonly for different types of, of models and stuff like that. And that is open science. It's used in different parts of the world. So we have kind of joined this community, this Beacon community. We have programmed various agricultural simulation models on, on this platform. At the moment, we have four models. We have Pascra model for organic soils and mineral soils. We have a model called STIX, which is more general model. And, and now we are working on including landscape D and DC model on the platform, which is like uh, better than the, these other three models uh, for, for some purposes. And then uh, as one model kind of alternative or option, what we are using is that we are using our own Yasso soil model. And that Yasso soil model is, for example, used in the Finnish greenhouse gas uh, inventory and also used in greenhouse gas inventories in uh, several other European countries. And it is also a soil carbon module of this Max Planck Institute Earth System model, which then is used for this, uh, running these uh, global climate change scenarios. Okay, that, that's the platform, uh, I mean that, the IT platform. And then uh, there, we, now if our task is to estimate the carbon balance for each of these fields that you see in, in, the, in, the, in the photo, then uh, we observe the leaf area index from the satellites, we have information from the fields, from, from the farming practices, and also maybe something from the soil quality information, like from Villiabus analysis and stuff like that. So with this quite limited information, we are able to calculate estimates for the carbon balance for each of these farms. But if we don't take any measurements, we, are not, we don't have any idea whether our, our calculations are reliable or not. And for that reason, we need uh, some reference sites where we take detailed measurements of those variables that we are calculating. So we are also calculating from this very limited input information, we're calculating the estimates for this reference size, but at the reference size we're taking the measurements, that makes it possible for me to see whether we are correcting the correct value or a wrong value. And most importantly, we are able to identify which aspects of the models, which parameter values, which structures we, need to, we would need to improve in order to improve the reliability. It also makes it possible for us to identify which measurements we would need to take in addition on these ordinary farms to improve the reliability of our calculations. So that is, that's the basic idea. And uh, yeah, and then, uh, like I said, that we need to develop the interface between the different uses of this natural science-based information in the society. And I've listed four there, greenhouse gas inventory, LCAs, carbon footprint estimates, and this developing carbon markets. And then in addition to that, we have developed a kind of online service where, where anybody can, can see what is happening on, on some of our study sites. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So if I try to sort of summarize the components of this verification method, it's like there's this, this method, the whole idea, we're combining the measurements and the model. And the measurements that we're using, they can be is that we take measurements of the carbon dioxide, other greenhouse gas fluxes. Uh, we use satellite measurements, we uh, need soil and vegetation analysis, and also we use microbial analysis, especially to learn more about the microbial processes in the, in the soil, so that we are able to uh, improve that part of our simulation models especially. Then we have the simulation models, we have the IT system, and then we have this field observatory for uh, uh, kind of demonstrating what, what, is, what is going on. And then there are these different applications and I will now run through some examples of each of these cat six categories to give some kind of idea what is this in practice. So that, that's the, uh, maybe nothing 
particularly new here. So I talked about the models that ha we have programmed to this open science platform. Uh, we have uh, like standardized data inputs to these models so that they, they're able to run. Uh, we, there are routines for uncertainty analysis, there are routines for kind of data analysis, data assimilation methods, calibration methods and stuff like that. And then there is also some illustration of this, how these natural science values need to be then uh, made such that they, they're useful for these uh, different uses in the society. Second about the measurements that, that we, we use, there on the uh, right hand side, there's that actually University of Helsinki Edico Variance Measurement Station in Haltiala Fields, north of Helsinki. There in the, the other larger figure shows uh, soil sampling with this kind of a tractor powered uh, machine. And then in the top left corner, and the, the, there is an, a manual soil chamber, and the other one is like an automatically closing soil, uh, soil chamber. And the, what is there in the back is a, is a greenhouse gas analyzer. When the, when the chamber is closed, it can analyze the, how the greenhouse gas concentrations change inside the chambers, and that gives indication of the, how much soil emissions and what is the photosynthesis and stuff. And then there in the middle, that's just that the illustration of uh, the detail. Of, of this uh, leaf area index measured by the Sentinel-2 satellite, so the pixel size is about 20 meters times 20 meters. Some uh, idea about, about these uh, measurements. Then maybe the simulation models are even more difficult to kind of illustrate, but what they are is that they are, like Gusten was saying about this kind of the uh, machine learning methods. So the idea of these models is to try, some people talk about process-based models, so the idea here is to, is to describe the essential ecosystem processes as realistically as possible and also as uh, accurately as possible to, to these models. So that there's a description of photosynthesis, allocation of carbon, respiration, water balance, uh, decomposition processes in soil and yeah, things like that. So I have, uh, it's difficult to see, but the, the grassland model Basra N is on the uh, left hand side, and then our own uh, Yasso model for soil model is, is there on the right hand side. Something about the how, how we need, how about the calibration of this model, just showing that the, uh, this is an example of calibrating this Basra N model, a grassland model for uh, one of our study sites in Kvitja in southwestern Finland, leaf area index in the top graph and uh, carbon dioxide flux in the bottom. So without any measurements, we would end up in estimating this like a pink area that, that would be our estimate, highly uncertain. But when we have these satellite estimates from leaf area index, which we receive every three days if it's not cloudy. If it's cloudy, we do not receive anything. But the, we get the estimates of leaf area index and that helps us to calibrate the, the, the model. And also we, have, we are measuring continuously this carbon dioxide flux, so that uh, makes it possible also to calibrate it, like use this carbon dioxide flux estimates to calibrate. And uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize that the various measurements are used simultaneously to determine the parameter value. So it's not that we're determining the leaf area index parameters by comparing to leaf area index. That's not the approach, but various measurements are used simultaneously to, to quantify all of the parameter values in, in the model. And by doing this, we have a more suitable model for simulating grasslands than we had in the beginning. And then something about this, uh, maybe also related to this question or the discussion about the how long it takes to uh, detect uh, changes in soil carbon by taking repeated soil carbon measurements. So, uh, well, that's kind of a, if, if you just are looking for the statistical difference uh, between two uh, measurement occasions, that, that takes long. But you, there are also other means of using these uh, repeated soil carbon measurements to, when you link these to uh, simulation models. So what uh, Tony Viscari and us, and us others in our research group have developed is a kind of a state data assimilation methodology, which means that when you're doing the model simulation, you are able to inform the simulation to the future by only like, like taking just, just a few measurements. Like for example, if, if you look at the, this Ultuna uh, figure there, like if, if you had, if your task was to estimate, th these are by the fallow experiments, not, no carbon input. If, you, if your task was to estimate the, how the soil carbon decreases over time in 58 
and that was the, the black line is, is your the simulation. When you get the, the second measurement, then sometime in the 1970, you get the orange line. So that's much closer to what happens in the future. So really, you can use these repeated soil measurements in other ways also than just the, looking at the confidence intervals. Yep, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly. So to enable these calculations, and uh, we have needed to establish this kind of a data flows and this IT system, so that has also included quite a bit of a kind of a IT uh, architecture, uh, planning and designing, and now we are able to simulate like a online, something like 10 sites or a few tens of sites, but when we are sort of visioning that if, if we need to simulate like hundreds or thousands of sites in the future, then we also need to think about this, uh, this uh, computing capacities. And that is something that we have been doing together with the IT department at uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute. There's a good experience on that because we also do the weather forecast, so we can use the same kind of experience. And I will uh, spend the rest of this, uh, my minutes here uh, talking about this uh, field observatory. This is the kind of the a service which we have developed in order to illustrate what we are after with our measurements, what we are after with our verification methodology. You can find it there in the fieldobservatory.org or in Finnish in peltoobservatoria.fi and also in Swedish, but I don't remember the name. <laughs> yes, so what we have included there, so yeah, we started to include some of our sites there and what we have there now is that we have uh, we have a, a few edicovariance measurement sites run by us at FMI, also run by University of Helsinki. We have uh, one Svensk school in Larkring site in southern Sweden included there. Just a yeah, nice collaboration and looking forward to expanding that. There are, there are 20 of these ordinary farms we have included uh, in, in that and their carbon experiments. Uh, we have uh, 10 uh, f experimental fields of Valio. Valio is a Finnish dairy company there. And then we have also, uh, I think, three sites of urban green space in Helsinki and in, in uh, Espo. But some examples, what you can see there is that the, uh, this is an example of, of this continuous greenhouse gas, uh, carbon dioxide measurement in our Kvitia, Kvitia farm. So on the graph, you can see that when the, when the value is on the plus side, it the, the field acts as a, a source of carbon, and when it's on the negative side, it acts as a sink of carbon. And that field, like many fields, they act as a source of carbon during the night when the photosynthesis stops, but a sink of carbon during the growing season when the photosynthesis is on. And the, the line there shows the daily values, and there you can see the 15-day forecast of the carbon balance on this farm that we uh, update daily around uh, 6 o'clock p.m and uh, taking into account the measurements and the, the leaf area index measurements if we have received new information from the satellite. So the approach uh, uses similar methods as, as doing weather forecasting. So, yeah, and that's as such is, is one of the first operational carbon balance forecasts of this kind in the world. And then looking at this, how what we have observed, we have carrying out these this, this measurements continuously at that site for four years now. We started in the, around 1st of May in 2018. And that line there show, shows how the carbon stock has developed since we started our measurements. So that site has accumulated something like 400 grams of carbon per meter squared during that time. And you can see the peak of the carbon uh, stock always uh, after the, at the end of the growing season and then a slight decrease when respiration goes on during the winter time. Yes, and then we have these carbon action farmers who have carried out their uh, like carbon farming experiment that lasts for five years. We will do the second soil sampling next year or the beginning of the, the following year. And this is what a carbon action like experiment may look like. The carbon farming practice on the uh, left-hand side, and then the business as usual practice on the right-hand side. And then finally, what we are, so what we have done is that we have sort of started from uh, making, putting this system and the components together, and now what we need to do is that we need to improve in including like specific farming practices and specific uh, effects of different soil properties, biodiversity effects, and now the food security viewpoint has become more and more important 
both because of the climate change and also like the change situation of the world. And then uh, if we are to apply that for a large number of sites, we need to pay attention also to this application service development and this IT solution and developing these application program interfaces. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Jari, and thank you for keeping the time exactly <laughs> also. Um, any questions from the audience at this point? Um, yes, uh, my question was regarding the, the models. This Baskara you said was mostly for grasslands. So uh, the other models, are they mainly for then croplands or how, how does that work for more cropping systems? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the other two were like there was Baskara, one, one Baskara version. Baskara is only for grasslands, and we need one version for mineral soils and, and another version for uh, grass grown on an organic soil. Then Styx is, is the third of our models, and that is a more general model. You can use that for, uh, for like crops and also for grasslands. And then it's this land D and DC model, which is uh, uh, mm, at least one of, one of the kind of the advantages we're looking for is, is to be better able to simulate nitrous oxide emissions. But I, because I don't, I'm not aware of the, all the details of that model, but there are also other advantages to that. But I mean, in general, the idea of adding several models is that it makes it possible. That our idea is that, it, that we can carry out the simulations for the same site using this, the, like different models. And that then keep, makes it possible for us to evaluate the uncertainty in the estimates that results from do, using the different models. So to analyze the uncertainty caused by like the model error or uncertainty in the model structure. So that's the idea of the whole platform, that so that we would be able to carry, like, simulate the same sites using various models, rather than looking for the best one, because, uh, I mean, every model has its advantages and disadvantages, I know. Thank you. Personally, I think that this was a very excellent question because I had the same in mind that maybe mm. we could elaborate a bit why to use so many different models, but this, this was really good further explanation. Uh, any other questions? I think we have time for one or two more. No, don't hesitate to ask. As Yari said, this is uh, difficult to illustrate and maybe can uh, feel a bit complicated. Also, I don't see any questions in chat either. Hello, uh, Eija Hagelberg from Baltic Sea Action Group. I don't actually know how to really put my words here or how, how to ask this, but I'm trying. Um, yeah, we know that climate change is, is just happening and going on all the time, and we have seen many very difficult growing seasons last years, first very wet and then very dry, also here in northern Finland, northern Europe, but uh, especially in, in the northern, more countries, really big problems with heat and drought and these kind of things. So um, when you make these, um, these forecasts and um, models, have, have you been thinking about that the agriculture in northern Europe, for example, I think it will change somehow because we, we have to change some things because of the drought in summers and these kind of things. Or does this matter anything to your models that things will change? Mm. Yeah, thanks, Eja. So uh, one of the uh, advantages of taking this process-based modeling approach rather than doing something like um, uh, more statistical approaches uh, based on the, what we are observing now is exactly that. So that these models, when the, 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 the idea is to describe these processes there as realistically as possible, so that it makes it, these models particularly suitable for analyzing the effects of climate change. Whereas compared to something that if you develop a statistical relationship from today's world, and the drivers like climate, you know, it's, it's very important. The climate will be different in the future. That makes these kind of a Statistical relationships developed from the, from the present time, uh, kind of a less useful or it adds an un aspect of uncertainty to this relationship, whether they will hold in the future or not. So that's one of the key reasons why we have chosen this approach. But if, if, they, if this may seem sort of unpractical, also these models 
can be. And we have a plan to develop, kind of use these models to develop kind of emission factor types of solutions. So we are all the time, even though this is uh, rather complicated, we admit that, we question ourselves all the time about this, is this really necessary? But, the, uh, but at the same time, and the whole of the duration of the carbon action, we have been, uh, We've thought it's very important for us also to be able to contribute all the time to the practical information needs and develop kind of a practice-oriented, maybe a little bit more simplified uh, solutions out of this system that we're developing. But then in the future, I mean, a system like this, I mean, let them know this is Technical uh, development does not limit, or technical capacity does not limit, limit a thing like that. So, I mean, if we are sending like me moisture measurement equipment to Mars, that measure in Mars at the moment, or if we have mobile phones, I mean, this is not anything that's more complicated than that. <laughs> and FMI sends these instruments to Mars, so. <laughs> thank you, Jari. Thank you again. And thank you for all your good questions. Let's have our next speaker. We will have Helena Soinne from LUKE, from Natural Resources Institute Finland. Uh, Helena is a senior scientist there and she will speak about carbon sequestration into mineral agricultural soils. Okay, good afternoon also on my behalf. And my talk today is about uh, soil organic carbon uh, in mineral agricultural soils. And first I will talk about the uh, processes that are supported by soil, soil organic matter in, in mineral soils, and then a bit about how much organic carbon fits into mineral soils in Finland. And If you have it right way, then it works. Great. <laughs> so in this first slide, I, I listed these uh, soil functions that are supported by soil organic carbon. And these soil functions or ecosystem services are here in these green boxes. And in these blue circles, there are these uh, soil processes that are mediated by soil organic carbon and therefore they support these soil functions or ecosystem services. So, for example, uh, mineralization of nutrients and, and soil aggregate formation, these kind of processes support the primary production in, in soils. So, soil organic matter supports these physical, chemical and biological processes that sustain soil functions. And in this, uh, that previous figure, we could so see that uh, soil aggregation is important process for uh, uh, soil uh, water quality related uh, issues in, in soil. And it is quite well known that uh, in soils that have a high uh, organic carbon content, the aggregate stability is also higher. So in this figure in the middle, we can see that as the soil organic carbon increases, also the stability of soil aggregates increases. And, and in soils that have a better aggregate stability, there is a lower risk for soil erosion. And also that means that there is a lower risk for particulate phosphorus export from, from these fields. Also good aggregate st structure indicates that there is a reduced risk for surface soil uh, sealing. And, and if, that, if you have a good aggregate structure, then also the surface soil porosity is better and soil will infiltrate water better. Also, uh, in addition to uh, total soil, soil organic carbon content, uh, clay to sea ratio has been uh, suggested as an indicator for a good uh, soil structure and good aggregate stability. The higher the clay content, the more organic carbon is needed to reduce the dispersion of uh, clay-sized particles and therefore to maintain the good soil structure. So if you have a, a low uh, clay to sea ratio, which means that there is uh, uh, quite a lot of organic matter in the soil, but uh, not so high clay content, then there's these uh, clay-sized particles are likely covered by organic matter and this these organic molecules, they, they act like a, uh, as a glue that bind these mineral particles together and that enhances the uh, aggregate formation in soil and therefore 
therefore uh, improves the uh, stability of the aggregate structure. In literature, there has been suggested uh, threshold values for this uh, clay to see race uh, from uh, 8 to 13, meaning that if you have a higher clay to organic carbon race uh, than uh, 13, then the soil would have a poor structure. Um, also, in the first slide, you could see that uh, soil organic carbon has a role in, in, in improving soil uh, primary production, and organic carbon uh, sequestration and increase in soil organic carbon has been pro promoted to, to, to increase the yield levels. But, and uh, generally, it is uh, accepted that the greater soil organic carbons are related to greater yield levels in, in soils. Uh, in this uh, meter analysis by uh, Oldfield et al., they uh, gathered a lot of uh, data from maize yields and they plotted them against uh, soil organic carbon level. And they saw that there is a positive correlation between the yield levels and soil organic carbon content up to uh, organic carbon content uh, of 2%. And after that, the relationship was not that uh, clear anymore and, the, and leveled off. Uh, of course, the organic carbon content, 2%, uh, uh, it's not very high if we consider Finnish fields. And we also did in uh, Oranki uh, project, we measured also yields in Finnish fields and uh, plotted them against uh, the organic carbon content in those fields. And this uh, uh, was not so clear, this relationship between uh, the, the organic carbon content and yield levels, but uh, with some help uh, with the, from a statistical modeling, we could uh, see that their organic carbon content and the yield levels have a positive uh, relationship, but uh, there is a lot of things affecting, in addition to the, of course, to the the, in addition to the uh, organic carbon content, and that's why we need to uh, do some little more research and, and look more this model. But from this uh, Oranki data, we have already noticed that when we plotted those yield levels against uh, clay to sea ratio, we could see that uh, soils that have a high clay to sea ratio, meaning that there is a quite low carbon content and quite high uh, clay content, they uh, likely produce lower yields when we compare them to the soils that have a low uh, clay to sea ratio. So this uh, uh, clay to sea ratio that has been suggested as an uh, indicator for soil structure, it also indicates a, a, a poor productivity for the soil. And this was for the clay soils. And, and for the coarser soils, there was a, a positive correlation between cation exchange capacity and yields. And it is quite well known that uh, soil organic matter contributes significantly to the cation exchange capacity. And this is especially important in, in uh, coarse textured soils. So uh, as shown, in this first slide, uh, soil organic matter affects soil processes like aggregation and, and nutrient retention, and these processes determine the soil's capacity for functioning. And these results indicate that the key process that uh, is maintained by soil organic matter and sustained uh, soil productivity, it might differ depending on soil properties, like de depending on soil texture. Then I uh, will talk uh, about mom and POM and, and a bit how much organic carbon fits into mineral soils in Finland. Uh, for a long, soil organic carbon has been characterized based on its chemical properties, but now more and more the characterization is being done based on uh, physical properties of this organic matter. And according to this, uh, this type of uh, physical characterization, uh, most of soil organic matter in soil is in the form of particulate organic matter or as uh, mineral associated organic matter. And then there is a, a small proportion also in dissolved form. 
And so this uh, mineral associated organic matter, it is attached to mineral particles and this association protects these, uh, these uh, organic molecules from microbes. So it is not mineralized so easy when it's attached to mineral surfaces. So uh, MOM is uh, more, uh, less labile and uh, more stable when we compare it to the, to the particulate organic matter that is not protected by mineral surfaces. However, the mineral surface area in soil is limited and it's defined by soil texture. So it might be that in, in some cases when you have a very high soil organic matter content and not so much clay sized and silt sized, sized particles, the surfaces may become saturated by organic matter. Then uh, the POM, the particulate organic matter, it is uh, light and it's more accessible for the microbes and uh, therefore it is uh, more sensitive to the changes in soil, like uh, changes in soil management or uh, changes in climate, that kind of changes that uh, increase the microbial activity in soil. However, there is no limit how much there can be POM in soil. For example, there is a lot of POM in beet soils, but, but they, are then, okay, they are not mineral soils. Yes, and of course there is a, a grey area between these two uh, physical fractions. Be, uh, uh, there is uh, POM molecules that are very slowly degraded, so they are more st stable than the majority of the POM. And then again, MOM, the mineral associated organic carbon, can contain uh, molecules that are quite easily mineralized and, and can be used as an energy source for the microbes can be used them. So, so this is uh, just a way to characterize, but there is something in the middle that is not so easy to put in either one of these categories. So in uh, theory, the mineral associated organic matter can uh, reach saturation in soil that have a high organic carbon content, but low uh, lay content, so then it would reach uh, mom saturation. But then again, in soil that has a low organic carbon content, but has a high amount of clay, there is uh, a lot of available surfaces for the uh, protection of carbon by the, these minerals. So these mineral surfaces are available for the carbon that, will, that, that could be uh, entering the soil. So these kind of soils are potential for uh, carbon storing and sequestering so that they can protect the soil, the organic carbon quite well. So uh, these uh, soils that have a high clay to sea ratio, they, ha they are potential for, for uh, carbon sequestering. And uh, the capacity of soil to store mineral associated organic carbon has been calculated based on the silt and clay sized particles because their the surface area is so high. And here is some uh, equations uh, that reported in the literature and how it's been uh, done. And also I want to note here that uh, here is the Dexter's uh, uh, magical number 10. Dexter et al. Uh, suggested that clay to sea ratio of 10 would be the saturation point of mineral associated organic carbon, and this has also been suggested as a threshold for a, for a good soil structure. And we did some uh, mompom fractioning uh, in Multa project, and these were done at the University of Helsinki. Uh, we fractionated uh, mom and bomb from the clay soil field that had a different organic carbon contents uh, and the difference in this organic carbon originated from the different kind of management history in this field. And, oh, I forgot to say it in the previous slide that uh, I was so excited about the Dexter's 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I forgot to say that uh, the, uh, the mom uh, sorption capacity has also been estimated by the uh, soil organic carbon content, so Potru for et al. 
published a paper where they showed that uh, in European soils, the mom content did not increase in soil when the soil total organic carbon had reached uh, 5%. So after that, only particulate organic matter could be sequestered in soil. Yes, but we did this uh, fractionation and we tested this uh, Gotrufos flex point of 5% and we could see that, uh, that in this field, the, as the soil organic, the total soil organic carbon content increased, also the mineral associated organic carbon increased. So the flex, we did not see this kind of a flex point where the 5% of organic carbon would say that the soil is saturated by mom. Then we also tested this uh, mom bomb fractionation data against this uh, uh, Dexter's 10 and uh, clay to sea ratio. And from this figure, we can see that as the soil, soil uh, clay to mineral associated organic carbon ratio decreases, it won't go below 10, even though the soil organic carbon content increases. And also the highest particulate organic matter uh, content uh, were measured in those soils that had a, had a lowest clay to uh, mom race. So this uh, kind of uh, indicates that uh, this uh, mineral associated organic carbon sequestration slows down when soil is reaching the clay to uh, mom C race of 10. However, I want to point out that this is uh, still some uh, from one field only and preliminary, preliminary data, so some more research needs to be done on this one. But then uh, we did, uh, based on this uh, idea that mineral surfaces have a limited um, uh, capacity to store carbon onto their surfaces, we did this uh, preliminary calculation on how much uh, mineral associated organic carbon fits in, in uh, Finnish agricultural soils. And we used this uh, soil test data from uh, soil testing laboratories, and this data has only the, uh, the uh, texture and soil organic matter is assessed only by finger, so we needed to do some appro approximations to get uh, 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 clay content and organic carbon content for each soil sample. But this uh, shows our uh, maps Finnish, uh, for the Finnish mineral agricultural soils. And this first uh, green map shows the capacity of uh, soil to store the mineral associated, associated organic carbon. So, the, so how much, in theory, there can be uh, organic, uh, mineral associated organic carbon in these soils. And this uh, map in the middle shows, shows the soil organic carbon stocks uh, in different parts of Finland. And this last uh, map shows their difference. So from the total capacity that we estimated based on clay content, we uh, uh, took the existing soil organic carbon contents. And then the remaining value indicates whether there is still uh, room for the mineral associated organic carbon or whether the uh, soil indicates that it's already saturated by, by uh, uh, mineral associated organic carbon. And this map uh, like this, it shows unfortunately that uh, the red color shows that the soil is already saturated. So there is so much organic carbon that it won't fit into those mineral surfaces anymore. But uh, on the other hand, there is this small light green area in the southwestern Finland where we could have still room to sequester uh, organic carbon on those mineral surfaces. And this area is also crucial for the, for the nutrient loading to the Baltic Sea, so this area would really benefit from extra organic carbon to stabilize the structure there. And now, because I am running out of time, I should just say uh, this very quickly, that even though the map looked uh, really pretty bad uh, to, for the carbon sequestration point, the, there is still room for the 
uh, carbon in, in the deeper in the soil, so the below plow layer in, in, in the Finnish fields, the carbon content is really slow, uh, low, and, and there is still available surfaces for carbon sequestration. Of course, the question is how the carbon will, will be entered to the deeper layers. And, and there is a biological means, but also some mechanical means, and I will just show this as a teaser. Uh, we are doing some research on uh, deep tillage, and hopefully we get to report those results after a few years. It looks uh, dramatic, and, and there sure. might be some, some uh, uh, downsides on this one, but it's interesting, interesting to see what happens to the carbon that uh, is uh, inserted to the deeper soil layers. And then the summary. So, uh, uh, soil organic matter is important for soil functions, but how much organic carbon is needed for soil functioning, and uh, it depends on soil type. So, for example, the higher the clay content in soil, the more carbon is needed for good structure and, and good stability, uh, good productivity. Uh, fields with highest uh, clay to sea raise uh, and therefore with highest carbon sequestration potential seems to be in southwest, southwest Finland. However, the high uh, clay to sea ratio indicates bad productivity, which could mean that these fields would need an external organic matter input for improved productivity. So that would also benefit soil structure and, and reduce the erosion. And uh, there is also indication that uh, that uh, low clay to sea ratio means that there is an uh, increasing amount of particulate organic matter in soil, and particulate organic matter is sensitive for changes in management and uh, climate, and therefore at risk uh, to be mineralized, mineralized to the atmosphere. Then, uh, if we wish to reduce uh, carbon emissions and increase the carbon sequestration, we need to uh, adjust the management practices according to the soil type. So it is uh, crucial to understand the processes in the soil and how the carbon uh, affects the productivity and how we can increase the productivity, but also how much there is al al already carbon. So do we need external carbon inputs or do we need to protect the particulate organic matter from uh, mineralization. Thanks. And here is also the project listed that uh, where we have been studying this organic matter and organic carbon reactions in soil. Uh, Orangi has ended, but uh, Hiletin and Multa projects are still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And we heard from the soil point of view where, where we have the potential to add uh, more carbon in the soil and how it is sequestered. I think we have time for um, at least one question. So do we have questions from the audience? Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I was just thinking from a measuring point of view, because if, if it's, as you say, it reaches 5% in MOM, then you cannot, you reach a plateau, you cannot sequester anymore, but the POM, you can actually, there might be no limit to that. Yeah. So, but normally in soil tests, you only get the, the MOM, right? So it would then your suggestion be to definitely measure both of these in order to get a decent picture of what, how we do it. Yeah, um, normally in soil test you measure the total organic carbon, so you get the total amount which includes uh, both MOM and POM. But uh, I've been wondering whether it would be actually, if you could see uh, smaller changes if you do this kind of fractionation, so that, that would reduce the variation in the measurement and then you could probably see if you are sequestering MOM or are you increasing the, the POM. Thank you. We have a second question here from Yari. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Helena, for the very interesting collection of, of uh, results and the over, overview picture. Is that, so my question is that actually related to that one and what you were just uh, answering is that we have this decreasing trend 
in soil carbon in Finland. So do you have any like idea? You, and that has been, I know that the total carbon has been measured, or maybe not, but still, do you have any idea? C can you say anything about, the, is it the particulate organic matter or mineral associated organic matter that is decreasing in our soils, or both? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't have any res uh, like real results on that one, but uh, the paper published by Jaakko Heikkinen et al. actually showed that in those soils that have a, have a higher uh, clay to sea ratio, and they, they used actually clay plus silt, but uh, that uh, clay to sea, uh, higher clay to sea ratio, in those soils the, the uh, uh, reducing trend has uh, stopped, and it, it, the, clay con uh, the co organic carbon content does not decrease so fast in those soils that have a, a high clay to sea ratio, so that means that there is a more mom than bomb that would indicate that it actually it is the bomb that is uh, decreasing and the bomb is uh, remaining and uh, starts to decrease after the bomb the energy source for the easy energy source for microbes has been like used thank you i think um, at this point it's time for coffee break, so let's go for that. And one, for one more general information before that is that this session will be recorded. So this will be available also later. But have a nice coffee break and come back in time. We will continue at uh, 15 to 3. So we have half, a, half an hour coffee break. Okay, please come in and have a seat so that we can start the second half of this international session. Thanks. <laughs> I hope we have all our speakers also here present. I'm not really sure, but I just really hope so. <laughs> So if I can say again a couple of practical things before we start. Uh, one thing is that, uh, which I mentioned just before the coffee break, but also for the second half in case someone uh, just so joined us. So this session in this uh, uh, lecture room now will be also recorded and it will be available later as well. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, general information that, which I have is that uh, on, the, on the first half, unfortunately, I didn't see all the chat messages that you sent, but uh, the problem has now been corrected. So, so also the uh, audience online, please, uh, you can send your questions in chat, and this time I should actually see them as well. So um, I'm sorry for that uh, problem that I, I didn't take your questions from the chat. Okei, okay, kyllä mun mielestä kuulostaa itsestä siltä, että on päällä. <laughs> Okei, okay. yes, should be, should be fine. Okei, okay. um, so our first speaker of this uh, second half is Tuomas Mattila. Is Tuomas here? Good. So uh, Tuomas Mattila uh, from the Finnish Environment Institute and also is a farmer, uh, but also senior research scientist. And Tuomas will uh, talk about how carbon farming impacts soil health. So welcome, Tuomas. Is this mic on? Yeah, good. Hi, everybody. It was. Two years ago since I've been here talking about soil health. Uh, last time I was talking about uh, OSMO project where we looked at soil health on a field by field basis and worked with farmers to improve soil health and looked like looked at that when we change soil health or attempt to manage it, what happens to all kinds of parameters. And today I'm going to talk about a bit different topic. So same topic, different topic. Here we're looking at what happens if we apply so-called carbon farming. What happens to soil health? So it might be that soil health is not a familiar term to you or it sounds vague or something like that. That's why the first question is, what is soil health? <clears throat> so 
There are several definitions of soil health. Uh, I think the most, how to say, robust definitions of soil health are those that it looks at the soil as an ecosystem and looks at the ecosystem functioning. So soil quality is another term which looks at uh, different parameters of soil and relates them to soil functions. So how soil health differs from that is that we try to look at a, how to say, a whole subsystem of the soil at a time. So like instead of looking at how much soil protein content increased at, with this, we try to link it to the big box of carbon metabolism in there. So it's more like a systems view on soil quality, if you approach it that way. And uh, of course, the question of, of carbon farming versus soil health isn't new. I have to point that out already. So several reviews have been written on it. And the challenging thing here is, as you might know, that soil health here defined as biological and ecological subsections of soil attributes, which affect soil quality and functionality, a bit of a different uh, approach again, uh, is that it has a lot of components here. And depending on where we focus and which, how we narrow the scope, we might get very different results. And it, it quickly becomes overwhelming, this kind of approach of soil health. How does carbon farming influence all this? So, uh, based on OSMO project, uh, where we worked with farmers improving soil health or trying to improve soil health, I would suggest that a much better approach to this is to answer the question, what is soil unhealth? Because whereas soil health can be a huge and broad topic, it's much easier to identify if something's not working in a soil. Okay. So <clears throat> what is soil unhealth? So one definition that we used in, in OSMO is that one or more of these soil quality parameters is seriously outside recommendation ranges, reducing the functioning of the soil ecosystem. So, <clears throat> and these don't, how to say, these don't compensate each other. So if you have a seriously compacted soil which has good amounts of nutrients, it's still in a state of unhealth. You have to kind of put everything <laughs> Into a, in the broad ranges of, of a healthy soil to have a healthy soil. That's the kind of idea there. And if you approach it this way, you get to the kind of a sobering conclusion that most agricultural soils are unhealthy, which can be good news or bad news. It can be bad news if you want to be a super farmer who has the most healthiest soils ever and has never any problems anywhere which is one attitude, but if you then have a <clears throat> another attitude where you see all kinds of problems as a way to develop the system. So then if you have unhealthy soils, it also means that you have a great potential for improving function and, and productivity of those soils. And if it would happen to be that this unhealth would also limit soil carbon sequestration, then we have a potential win-win here so that we could by fixing these limitations, constraints on soil carbon sequestration and productivity, if we can improve carbon sequestration and food production, then we can benefit both, which is basically the idea of the, the MULTA project, multifunctional uh, benefits or approaches to, to carbon farming. Do you know what carbon farming is? Probably, yeah. Good. Two years ago, people would be, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, progress. <clears throat> the, here's one example of, of carbon farming, widely published and, and there's two ways of, of increasing carbon stocks, either in soil or in your own belly. You either increase inputs or then you decrease outputs. So. Less exercise, bigger carbon storage, more food, bigger carbon storage, basically. And these different uh, carbon farming practices relate to this. So improved crop rotations, increased crop residues. Uh, for example, if you have a monocropping system of, of spring cereals, you have quite a 
little amount of plant residues. If you include an intercrop lay clover into the rotation, you increase the amount of plant residues quite, a mo quite much. So there's two ways of, of kind of pushing the system towards higher carbon sequestration. And the other option is to reduce carbon losses. So conversion to perennial grasses and legumes, less tillage, lower temperatures, le less decomposition, no tillage, and then very importantly, rewetting organic soils, because there the decomposition rate can be so high that you cannot compensate those with just increasing outputs. So here's the big picture. Then what's the small picture? The, the small picture is Again, messy, like all these lovely farming <coughs> soil research stuff. So in the carbon farming, <coughs> carbon ac action Healy-Pilotti experiment, there's 108 farms, so let's say about 100. Some of them quit. But so <coughs> there are 108 farms. Each of them have a split system. So they have a test field, control field, should be pretty even when the experiment starts, and then they do these kind of management actions there. Cover crops, uh, diverse grasses, subsoiling, soil amendments, grazing, and then all in for those who can't decide how to approach the problem. And out of these, we took 20 intensive sites, which we monitor every year. So all of these have uh, pre-soil tests, and end soil tests after five years, and from those we check what happens at the soil level. Uh, but then we have 20 intensive sites which have more intensive measurements done every year, and like agroecological monitoring and satellites and stuff like that. And then a few flux measurement sites where we get more accurate data. But so the question is that we have these farms, they do management actions, what happens with soil health? So what was the soil unhealth like? Here's the <clears throat> initial state at the start of the experiment, because if all the soils are healthy, there's nothing to improve. So do we have a problem to solve or not? We have a problem, yes. Uh, <laughs> we have many problems. <laughs> An engineering viewpoint. Problem, yes. Uh, on the biological side, uh, in 2019, when I went through these fields, low earthworms were a common occurrence. The problem is that we monitor in July, so we get low earthworms anyhow. So take this a bit of a, with a bit of salt. So it depends on the rainfall. Then some soils have really high carbon to nitrogen, so nitrogen immobilization. And uh, some soils, actually half of them had poor rooting. Then on the chemical side, the most prominent problems were manganese, boron, phosphorus, and sulfur. Out of these, you might be familiar that phosphorus and phosphorus and sulfur are quite critical for organic matter formation. So here we might have a win-win <laughs> there, <laughs> like improving this might improve carbon sequestration and production. And on the physical side, uh, almost all fields had a compacted layer at the topsoil, restricting root growth. Then a few of them had overall degraded structure by base scores being really high, and quite a few of them had low infiltration, and half of them had a drainage problem. So the drainage system was malfunctioning in a way or another. The farmers in the Carbon Action Project were recommended to start with a field where they have motivation to do things. So this might be a biased sample of all the fields, they might have chosen a problem field. But overall, I think there's kind of Finnish soils have problems. That's great. We can improve them. Good. <laughs> and the message there is that study soils are less than ideal. So you don't get this kind of stuff from a test plot, I hope. So there's grass diversity experiment. Soil structure seems OK, but they are compacted sections of it. The drainage map is visible from the aerial photo, meaning that there's good growth only on the drainage lines. And then this is from another field where we have a 
deep rooted crop known as, as, as winter rape, which everybody knows that because of its deep roots, it will really loosen the soil and produce a lot of carbon into the depth of seven centimeters because the soil was so compacted. So <clears throat> kind of we have management actions and then we have soils and then these interact and then you get the result. What has happened then? Uh, a lot of data here, sorry, but uh, this is just a scratch of the data we have currently. But what we see is that here's always the colored one is the experimental side and, and we have monitoring over several years. We see that some of these management actions result in higher uh, soil green cover, good, more photosynthesis. They result also in uh, higher biomass, standing stock biomass, which is good. A lot of them don't, but some of them have effect. And then this relates to microbial activity there, measured with a CO2 burst. So for example, carbon grazing, lay farming and cover crops seem to increase microbial activity quite a bit. This is based on one year, so we'll repeat this and get more data. But this kind of carbon farming does something. It increases the carbon inputs, it increases the microbial activity. But does it fix the problems that were identified earlier? Does this bring in more phosphorus or sulfur or does it fix the drainage? Probably not. Uh, and this is seen in water infiltration. So, okay, we, we get good signals and then the water infiltration is worse with, with in the intensive grazing, with cover crops and with lay farming. So it's complicated. <coughs> and the soil structure uh, seems to be getting worse in some cases. So the higher the score, the worse. If it gets above the line there, then it's a degraded soil. So overall, <clears throat> with carbon farming, we increase carbon inputs, we increase microbial activity, we kind of increase many of the things, but carbon farming is not targeted in uh, identifying and solving the problems that are there, the state of unhealth. Uh, but there are some weak signals for which we might not have uh, good methods yet. So, so I wanted to mention this because it was timely and cool. Uh, the, we monitor temperature and moisture from the soils. So with added compost on the soil surface, it kind of makes low sense that it seems that this carbon farming site is cooler and has more moisture there this spring now which can mean that it has lower microbial activity. So we have hard data on different components of soil quality and different components of soil health. Then we have hard data, which is pretty hard to interpret, which we are working on right now. But overall, it seems that uh, carbon farming fixes some of the soil unhealth problems, but it's not kind of a universal solution. So in summary, agricultural soils have conditions which limit both food production and carbon sequestration. Good. <laughs> carbon farming can address some of these. Good. <laughs> so crop rotation, deeper roots, more C inputs and more aggregate stability can fix some of those problems. But as such, carbon farming is not tailored to identify and remedy site-specific problems in soil health, such as major nutrient limitations, soil degradation, compaction, and drainage. So it, it overall, in these soils, has had minor effects on soil quality or health. And it might be that we are asking the question the wrong way around. And it might be good to ask it the other way around, that if we would start managing soils for improved soil health, what would be the effect on soil carbon sequestration? So maybe in two years, I can talk about that. Thank you. Interesting presentation. Thank you.
There is uh, one question. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask, what is the role of carbon farming with organic soils? What would you recommend to do with organic soils? To have grassland, not to do anything and abandon it? And what is your true opinion that what should we do with the organic soils? Thank you. Okay, do we have peatland <laughs> researchers here? No, <clears throat> I, okay. In SOMPA project, I'm, I'm looking at this. The, I think the wisest way to proceed would be to check if it makes sense to keep it in production or not. If it makes sense to keep it in production, then the water table has to come up and be controlled. So paludiculture or then just controlled water table. Because the problem is that if you leave them alone, the, the key parameter driving the greenhouse gas emissions there is the amount of mm. nitrogen that's uh, in a layer which gets oxic and anoxic. So if you, if you kind of <clears throat> raise the water table, you decrease the amount of nitrogen that's in a layer which gets oxic at some points. So with uh, paludiculture, you can mine out the extra nitrogen and then you can leave it alone. So that would be, but the water table has to come up to slow down the uh, degradation. Thank you. That was a clear uh, take home message. How about any other questions from the audience? Um, I just had a question regarding the, um, uh, the CO2 burst. How do you measure that? Ah, it's, it's a standardized test. Uh, it's the Birch effect, Qu quite old phenomenon. <clears throat> uh, you dry soil, then you take all the organic bits off, sieve it, <laughs> and then uh, you put uh, water there so that you fill 50% of the pore space, close a container and measure how much CO2 it produces. <laughs> with a CO2 meter, yeah. So, so uh, it, it's a, like how much CO2 you get out of a soil uh, in 24 hours. And it, it's an artificial measurement, but it, it correlates really well with the biomass and the amount of food that the microbes have. So it's a <clears throat> function of both the microbial biomass and the amount and quality of the food produces that. So CO2 burst, it's a, Google that, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Thomas. I, yeah. Oh, oh, question. I, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Thomas. Thanks very much. Yeah. Very interesting to see the observations from these uh, carbon action farms and these 20 farms. So my question is that the, so already now there's some indication that the carbon farming has had an effect. So how would you comment? So now we have uh, planned this experiment to be five years long. So how would you comment like the time course of these changes and like, is it enough or what would we benefit from a longer experiment and, and things like that? We have been like before you arrived, we were discussing about the how, for how long does it take to see the effects of this uh, like in, in carbon stocks and stuff like that. Mm. So that, that is why I'm changing. So this is very interesting because this is certainly kind of leading to the improved carbon sequestration if that is going to happen. So my question about this length of this five-year experiment, how would you comment? I think I, like <clears throat> it's ambitious. Uh, and for, for example, the cover crops were a big surprise because the cover crops basically, they increase on the carbon only by like 300 kilograms per hectare by, in the literature. So, and the whole carbon stock is several tons. So it's a bit surprising that with cover crops you see a big burst in, or, or increase in microbial activity already. So it's kind of, yeah. So, so for the whole carbon stock, five years is really uh, short unless you do massive stuff, like what I'm doing at my farm, because I realized this, so we apply like 40 tons of organic matter per year. So it's kind of, that will get a result. <laughs> error bars mean, but that, that's a real like a difference between the... That, that's a real difference, and, and the problem here that I didn't take the blocking uh, into account. So these are pairwise uh, observations. So it's kind of, this is now just a mean and a mean, but it might be that it's compared this with that. So the kind of difference between them might be even bigger than it seems on that chart. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. We have we would have one more question in the chat. Uh, I suppose that this is something that you already um, at least partly uh, dealt with in your presentation. But if you want to continue or generalize a bit more and, and say something in, in general in Finland. Uh, so the question was that um, how carbon farming impacts soil health in Finland and is it uh, does it depend on type of soil or cropping system? So if you want to elaborate a bit more um, the situation in Finland. Mm. All soils and cropping systems have problems. So <laughs> it's, it's just good. We can try to improve things. Uh, but where do we see biggest changes? I don't know, but that's a really good question. Mm. Like, yeah, maybe with 20 farms, because this is what I really like about this thing, this is that a lot of research is done so that you have one point, and then you start generalizing from that. And if that one point happens to uh, have, for example, severe compaction and drainage problems, then that one point has these. But we have quite a few points, so we can try to like, say that, hey, we did this here, 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 and here, and on these it worked, and here it didn't. Why? Which is nice. Also very complicated and doesn't result in good publications because <laughs> <laughs> you want for publication you want not to work with pure sand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Once more, thank you, Thomas, for okay. your presentation and all all the good answers. And okay. thank you for your no problem. questions. The ventilation here is brilliant. 400 ppm. <laughs> That's great to hear. And our fifth speaker of this session uh, has, has unfortunately changed, uh, but uh, luckily we have now Eija <laughs> Hagelberg from uh, BSAG uh, to give the presentation uh, on behalf of Elisa Malin. Uh, and uh, Eija is a project director uh, regarding regenerative agriculture. And uh, she will speak about the practices in the field regarding the regenerative farming. Thank you, Elisa. And good afternoon, all of you. <clears throat> and uh, I'm really happy to be here, even though I was not supposed to be here, or I was not going to be here, but I am here. <laughs> and uh, because Elisa, my colleague, uh, she's got a flu, and she couldn't come and she wanted to say her, greet her greetings to all of you. Uh, and she felt very sorry she couldn't come. So, Elisa, I'm here now. Hello. <laughs> yes, um, I'm uh, giving now this presentation about uh, what kind of activities uh, farmers have been doing in our carbon action platform and what kind of messages also we have uh, some kind of link between farmers and researchers to you as, as researchers or scientists. And... Um, I think this all is just so very interesting. Um, like I, I am not working with uh, with research, uh, but or I'm not doing research myself. But I'm working a lot with research and researchers. And when I was thinking now, for example, Thomas' pres Thomas presentation and Helena's presentation and what all inform information was there and on uh, how we should combine all these because it seems that every, everything uh, links and connects with each other and uh, we will have a lot of work to do, so don't worry. I hope you can get financing <laughs> because there's a lot to do. <laughs> Still a lot to do to understand these very uh, complicated mechanisms in the nature. Yeah, but now uh, from, from the scientific part really more to, to the farmer part and the well, how people do with this. Uh, in this title, there was this regenerative carbon farming. Um, there are lots of re different uh, terms on this whole topic. We, first, we talked about sustainable agriculture for many years, and then suddenly came some other terms, um, not suddenly, but little by little other terms. And this regenerative agriculture, it's very, uh, very popular nowadays, I think. Uh, there are many big uh, global food companies that uh, are interested in regenerative agriculture, but at the same time, there are also lots of different grassroots uh, movements which are um, 
uh, enhancing regenerative agriculture. It happens on many levels. Uh, there are different definitions and, and there are preparations of new definitions to Nordic uh, circumstances and so. And this is how we see regenerative agriculture here. And first of all, I see, say that we think that regenerative agriculture or regenerative farming is like a journey and it's, it's an approach of thinking that we want to do things a bit better and we want to go, go uh, forward with, um, with good things and, and do things better. So we see that uh, regenerative agriculture is a conservation and rehabilitation approach to food and farming systems. It focuses on topsoil regeneration. This is really crucial and this is important for us at Baltic Sea Action Group also. We focus so much on topsoil, uh, but also increase in biodiversity and improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services and, and of course supporting soil carbon sequestration, increasing resilience to climate change, strengthening the health and vitality of farm soil, and also uh, the health and vitality of farm and farmer and the whole farmer community. It's very important also. But there are differences, but this is the main thing. And I see this also just like Tuomas just said or were thinking in his presentation that I see that uh, carbon sequestration is part of something or result of something bigger. It's not the first thing, but it's part of, of when we are doing things good. So then we also get carbon to soils. But we have to start with with really working with soils. At Carbon Action Platform, which started at 2017, uh, we have different stakeholder groups and in the core very strongly is research and all the researchers. The work has, that has been done, uh, this has been made, uh, done mostly in, in Finland with Finnish research, but we have some foreigner um, uh, research institutes also. Um, and uh, r uh, several research funders. Now I don't remember what Yari said, how many uh, research projects are already in carbon action, but there were many, quite a few. <laughs> um, so research is the key because we want to really focus on, 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 on basing our work totally on, on scientific results. And, and, but yeah, but if there are only researchers doing great job and doing a lot of good results, but farmers would never hear about this. It would be very bad, I think. So we need farmers and we need policy makers and we need many other stakeholders to understand what the researchers have been doing. And we have also noticed that companies are one very important part of, of the whole understanding and far, uh, companies are interested in, in regenerative farming practices and how, how they could really uh, encourage their farmers to do this kind of work also. And so that we could make all these four parts, research, farmers, policy makers and companies understand each other and learn from each other, we need communication and media. And that is really big part of of the work at Carbon Action Platform. So about science, just quickly here to tell that uh, science is, is the basis of all and the research focus on many different topics and also on the social sciences. And what uh, is uh, important, and it was said al already earlier here that um, we have these 100 carbon farmers all around Finland. They have been here from 2018, and we are continuing to, to three, four years with the research. Um, and it's really nice to work with them. In, in this picture, we have Mikko Leikola and Anu Jurakko. They are farmers, cattle farmers in Lohja, Millola farm. I think that landscape is, may could be from New Zealand or somewhere, more, but it's from Southern Finland, actually. <laughs> it looks really nice. They are doing very nice um, uh, adaptive multi paddock grazing there with the Hereford cattle and also many other things. You can see the management of nature conservation area just behind them. And so they are one couple in, in this carbon action farm network. And these kind of farmers, uh, interested in trying new, th uh, trying new things and uh, piloting and they want to be in the 
front to find good solutions. What we very much say nowadays is that we need adaptive farming methods. Uh, this adaptive management is the new uh, key for us in our training of farmers and our all kind of um, coaching of farmers. Because it's not only what, but it's how. And I will go a little bit deeper to this later. Here are still some pictures of our nice farmers, Tommy Hasu and his wife Elina and their daughter. Uh, then in the middle, Juha Mikkola and Mika Malin. They are neighboring farms and uh, they got to know each other during this project and now they have bought some farming devices also together and, and do, do a lot of uh, peer support to each other. And then there is one farmer group, I think Tuomas Mattila is there showing something. And in this picture, in this map, you also see our farms and one of them is so far north that it didn't even fit in this picture. But so most of them are in the north, southern part of Finland. But what I really want to highlight is this peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's really crucial. It's important. It is what, um, what the farmers find maybe the best way to learn these things. So it's important that farmers have this kind of feeling that they can try and pilot new things and they can tell about also their mistakes to other farmers and um, not just trying to be the perfect farmer all the time, but mistakes are allowed and this kind of network uh, gives these possibilities. Uh, and then I have wrote here these easy on-farm methods because it's really important that these methods can be, must be easy. But at the same time, we know that, yeah, maybe the methods are easy, but then we have the climate all the time uh, that uh, says, no you, no, you did wrong, sorry. <laughs> maybe you thought you did right with these easy methods, but you did wrong because now we have totally different weather than what you thought. For example, last summer, many farmers, they have sowed uh, multi-mixture uh, uh, lays, but if it's very dry, nothing grows. And if it's very dry, nothing grows. We don't get any photosynthesis. Synthesis. How can we get carbon to soil? soil? Zero, we cannot. So we have to really know that if something goes wrong or it's, the weather makes things differently, we have to learn adaptive methods to do things, do something differently. And, and do do more. This is not easy. If it's not easy for the soil scientists to understand all the connections, it's not easy for farmers either. Um, that's why we have this new project called HITTI. It's called uh, Adaptive Carbon Farming Methods. We have two farmer groups and they will really, with these two groups, we really want to go deeper and deeper in understanding this how and, and why and when and what, what if this happened? What should I do now? And because, yeah, everything starts from that we have something green growing. And like I asked earlier from Yari uh, that uh, how this climate change, we know that it will make a lot of new problems for us also in the Northern Europe because drought is coming here worse than before. So even if farmers are trying to do their best, then the sun is just shining too hot and everything goes down. So what to do then? So if we want to get carbon to soils, we have to know what to do then. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tuomas Mattila uh, telling us the, the three main principles of increasing uh, carbon to soils. And it's simply maximize plant growth, maximize microbe food, and maximize protection. Uh, I am not going deeper into these because you can, you can read them from this, this uh, slide, uh, what it really means, but it's actually very simple when you look at it like this. But when, yeah, what we have found now so much that we have problems with, um, with uh, weather conditions, for example, it can put down water down everything farmers have been doing. But the better, better the soil health, the better uh, yield security and, and many things are better if the soil is in good, good, uh, good structure. And if good structure, uh, then there are possibilities for, for everything that is important. I also want to highlight here that we think that at World Dixie Action Group that carbon and food, they are absolutely grown on same fields. So we are not talking about some 
some secondary fields for carbon farming and food production for the better, better fields for food production, but they are done at the same fields. Yeah, here is a kind of list of these uh, measures for carbon sequestration, but, but uh, there are many different ways to do things, and I think we will need new methods also, but this is like the basic list we are using mostly. Uh, I have put the red color for the two first parts, uh, which is the water economy management and fix the soil structure, because like in the previous presentation you saw that very many fields have compaction problems, for example, or water economy drainage problems. So, before we go to any deeper uh, measures or these annual measures, uh, we have to take care that the soil is in good structure and the water goes where we want it to go. A, a good soil field uh, works as a sponge, so it takes the water, it holds it there, and then it releases it to the plants and, and and plants can grow. And I think we have a lot of things to do here. But maybe it's good, like Thomas said, we have a lot of possibilities. And then a, sec a third one really important is this year-round plant cover. Many different ways to do it, like cat crops or lays and, and so on, green manure and so on. Uh, I would like to point out from here this list, uh, this uh, rotational grazing especially, and then uh, something that has not been talked so much is this integrated pest management and especially biological control because for many other reasons also uh, it is good to uh, decrease the amount of, of chemicals in farming. I don't need to go there, you know what I mean. Uh, but I think that we don't know enough about biological control and I think we should really learn much more. There is so much we, we can learn. I hope we can focus on this more in the future, all of us, I mean, not just BSAT. Yeah. Okay, uh, how to scale this regenerative farming or carbon farming? Um, this is how we see this at Baltic Sea Action Group in our work. So this is all based on carbon action platform, what is happening there. Uh, this picture is, um, very new, it's from last week, we had one field day with farmers and you see what happens when farmers who are very enthusiastic about soils, when they meet each other, uh, they are digging and digging. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it looks like very, very interesting to see what is underground. Yes, so we have had these pilot farms um, and about approximately 100, a little bit more at the moment. Uh, but then, uh, we just cannot uh, think that farmers know how to do these things easily, so we need advisors. And we have actually uh, trained uh, in one of our project uh, advisors to soil management experts, and um, that's important. I think we need much more this kind of uh, advisors. So that is, that is one, one um, uh, there is a lack, lack of advisors for this purpose. We have established Carbon Action Club, where all of you can also join if you want. It's a network where we share information about soil management and carbon sequestration and regenerative farming and, and all these things. Uh, I can tell you more about that later, or maybe you just Google this word, you will find the link. It's in Finnish. Uh, then we cooperate with companies. We have e-learning. And after it, we have to go to also other, other ways like legisl how was that? Legis legislative <laughs> amendments uh, uh, and, and CUP program and these kind of things that steer how farmers can do these different measures. And it's really important that we have good agri-environmental climate schemes, but we also need good investment payments for farmers for soil management, and I really hope and I think we have actually good possibilities that in the next cap there will be good investment payment possibilities for farmers with soil management, better than at the moment. And then we want Finland and then we want the, this global and let's see how, how far we can go. Then we go to the Mars also after that. 
So three important things for us uh, is sharing information. This is actually the Baltic Sea Action Group role, very much we are linking different stakeholders. But in, in this um, farmer, farmer collaboration, especially the sharing information, and this is my big message also for all scientists here, other, all researchers, that um, we need to get results from the science uh, to farmers so that they can know what it means. And we are actually working with this at the moment. And I can see that Vera Naukkarinen is sitting over there and she's doing at Baltic Sea Action Group this, this work so that we are, she's making, uh, writing, together with Elisa Vaini, actually we were cooperating, uh, making the scientific articles more easy to understand the shorter version. And, and we hope that this uh, message can reach also farmers. And we are thinking that we have to have their section with the, what does this mean in practice? Because that is, that is important for farmers. Then we want to uh, support peer learning. And then what is really important also is that how to, how to share this practical uh, farmer knowledge to scientists. I think we need this very much as well. And there's a lot to do. And I hope we can discuss this maybe later here. How, how, do, how to work with these things together, scientists and farmers. Uh, this is the online course we are having at the moment. This is in Finnish and in F and Swedish, uudistavaviljely.fi. Uh, this is where, where farmers and all other agriculture um, pro professionals and all interested in regenerative agriculture can learn a lot. Uh, it's written text and it's also read. It's like a, a, a voice book available in Finnish at the moment. So please feel free to, to uh, check this. And our message also is that farmers are not the problem. Farmers are the solution because farmers are also very tired of being blamed for many, many things all the time. But this is actually such a nice thing that we as an environmental NGO, we can do easily this thing with farmers because there are just winners here if the soils are in good condition because the farmer wins and the environment wins and, and also all, everybody who eats wins <laughs> because, because we need food and we need food uh, security and, and we need these things and when we take care of our soils, we get all this and even get carbon back to soils. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eija. Thank you so much for coming here on behalf of, of Elisa. Uh, uh, we have at least a couple of questions in the chat, so maybe we will start with those. And uh, I think we have already today heard something about uh, the uh, compaction of the soils and, and the deep-rooted plants. Uh, but uh, Jukka Rajala is asking in the chat about regenerative farming, uh, then why we focus only on improving topsoil and uh, that often subsoil is compacted uh, with poor, poor drainage. So if you want to continue something about this topic a bit more. Okay, thank you, Jukka. Jukka is, by the way, the one who was coaching these advisors in our project. Hello, Jukka. <laughs> so, um, yes, topsoils, it's the easiest part, but actually in, in Carbon Action, uh, there were taken soil samples from 30 farms, also to one meter deep, and we are going to repeat this after, after a four-year period. Uh, so we are interested also in, in, in the deeper... Uh, re deeper um, levels, so not, not just the topsoil. Um, yeah, maybe it was actually um, too narrow, say it like that, but yeah. So that if you think about topsoil as 30 centimeters and something going under it to one meter, there is a lot of potential also there and that need to be uh, also used for carbon sequestration and better soil uh, structure. Thank you. Uh, we can take the second question from the audience, if, uh, from the live audience, if, if someone has a question here. Let's take from here. So you mentioned rotational grazing, yes? So that's a question I've wondered with 
sequestering carbon. So animals put manure on the ground, which adds some carbon, but they can also cause massive degradation if they overgraze. What's the balance there? How do you balance that? Okay, very quickly, I could talk about this whole day, but <laughs> I try to say just very quickly, uh, overgrazing is always bad, and overgrazing is not carbon sequestration. So we have to be very adaptive with these grazing methods and uh, just leave quite a lot of the grass, actually, after grazing, and then move the animals to the next grazing sector uh, so that uh, they can... They, so that. In one, like one hectare, you can put it, a lot of uh, fences in, into it or move the fences so that the animals are just short time in one area and the all other parts of the grass uh, can rest and grow at that time. But yeah, it's a, it's a kind of balance. And, and I think it needs also always learn, understanding of the local soils, local vegetation, and the animals, what kind of animals are grazing. Not just one rule for that, but quite a lot of rules. But that this is learning by doing, mostly. And yeah, I have also heard many farmers who have been started this adaptive multi-paddock grazing. They are very happy because they have longer grazing season and uh, everything, it's easier to handle the animals and the uh, hay grass, it grows better and, and many, many uh, impacts, positive impacts. I hope I answered. Thank you. I guess we can take a really quick question if you have a quick one. Okay, hello. My name is, my name is Kai Graham, colleague of Elias and, and Elisas. Uh, you mentioned uh, the social science aspect, and I thought that maybe you, you have some tips for, for the scientists here. What kind of uh, social science questions you have, uh, you have considered, and do you have some, uh, some, some opinion what should be studied from the so social science perspective in terms of the uh, transition and farmers' uh, adoption of, of this approach? Thank you. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so a big question, and I have a lot of things in mind because we work with people all the time, and these these thoughts and questions come to mind all the time. But I, I, I personally, I see that it's really uh, interesting. It would be interesting to know where the farmers get the motivation, the inspiration, and information, and. Actually, I am a PhD student, and I, this is my topic actually there, but I don't have time to do it, but never mind. Uh, but um, where, where, where to get the inspiration and these kind of things, and how can we uh, somehow try to scale this inspiration and, and clone it to, oh no, clone, copy it to other, other farmers also? That's, that's really important. But there are so many, so many. I can't start to list it here now, <laughs> because I think next speaker is waiting. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And this was a very suitable question, <laughs> a very good question at this point, because we are now uh, our last speaker. Thank you, Eja. Yes. Our last speaker uh, is uh, a bit talking about social sciences, and uh, he is Olli Pekka Ruuskanen, research director from Pellervo Research, uh, Pellervo Economic Research, uh, PTT, uh, and also uh, adjunct professor in University of Vasa. Welcome. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much and, and hello everybody. I have the challenging uh, task to keep you awake before the wine and the posters. Uh, but let's see, I hope at least that the subject matter, if not the presenter, is uh, interesting enough to keep you kind of motivated. Uh, <clears throat> there are fashions and fads in science. And uh, one can also say that maybe this nudging uh, is uh, kind of a little bit fashionable uh, subject matter at the moment. However, this uh, hype curve is unfortunately going now to the downward phase, and more and more critical voices are being heard uh, about uh, the possibility to nudge people to different kind of uh, behavioral change. The second thing also is that when you cast a stone in Ivy League uh, University in US, the waves take about 10 to 15 years to land in remote Scandinavian uh, 
uh, research institute. So we can also see that, that a lot of work has already been done and we are kind of catching it now and also applying it multidisciplinary uh, to different fields. Now, the, the, the notes or thoughts I'm going to present uh, in this presentation stems from the, uh, from the research uh, project TUIMA, which is funded by the Ministry uh, of Agriculture, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, it's part of their Catch the Carbon uh, research program. Uh, we are looking at actually uh, how to steer um, agriculture and also forestry in the climate-wise land use by using these nudges. Now, there is a lot of researchers in this project. That is to our advantage. And as you can see, there is a lot of institutes. However, the, the stuff that I'm now raising up in this presentation actually comes from a, a work um, that um, uh, has Juuso uh, Alto Setala, who has been looking at specifically these nudges uh, as they have been applied to agriculture. And also then uh, Mats Gordon, Helm and me who have been more kind of like a theoretical side. I, I'm an economist as, as he is like uh, in a kind of um, general economic sense. And my background actually is in, in, in risk management and insurance studies. Uh, it's also a bit challenging because I know that there is uh, not only social scientists, but real scientists here also, uh, natural scientists, and, and, and maybe this area is a little bit uh, unfamiliar to you. Uh, so I have to kind of balance between the kind of uh, economic research and, and then, you know, the, 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 the way of kind of looking at this at the more general level. So my apologies already. Uh, but I was thinking that I could start from, from actually defining, in a sense, that what is a nudge. Um, and um, when we steer behavior, uh, there has been uh, traditional instruments, which you all are familiar with. It is the regulation uh, that says whether you can do something or, or not. Uh, it's usually, you know, or then it kind of gives a clear guidelines uh, when something is allowed uh, and when something is not. Then there is, of course, the taxes uh, and subsidies that then changes the, the, the price, uh, comparative prices between different goods or activities. And that is also one you know, traditional way if uh, you want to kind of uh, affect the, 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 the decisions to like to internalize through the price system. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 at, uh, you know, the objectives of the policymakers. This nudge comes from this liberal, anti-paternalistic uh, philosophy, where you try to uh, get people to uh, act in the way policymakers want, without any way reducing their choice set, the set of possible actions they take. Uh, therefore, uh, it's kind of like sounds very, very um, easy and, and, and kind of uh, appealing way in this kind of liberal time. Uh, and the way this will uh, usually be, is done is that, that you present, you, you change the choice architecture, uh, how you present things to the decision maker, uh, and you make some uh, choices that you want to favor more appealing to that. However, uh, there has been a lot of like policy initiative all around the world. Uh, these kind of nudge units uh, uh, founded in the in the government, uh, different governments. Uh, the the actual hardcore uh, social science or economic thinking behind these setting the limits is kind of like still. Uh, work in progress, uh, although this, as I said, has been kind of like a buzzword for more than 10 years. And we now start to see that actually the attitudes and the background and the, of course the structural barriers in the, in the society. Now, one also has to remember that this is very individualistic approach uh, to decision making. It kind of like lacks the kind of sociological uh, background or, or which then manifests, for example, in these structural barriers. And it's very important to assess and compare 
this effectiveness of these nudges, especially in agriculture, uh, and, and whether they could be used uh, as uh, additional policy instruments uh, to substitute or to complement uh, these traditional um, instruments like regulation and taxation. Uh, there has been a, a number of uh, kind of schematizations of energies, and, and one very popular is this Barnes, uh, where he proposes that uh, these energies could be actually uh, categorized into four main types, where one is like provision of information, changes in the physical environment, or, or then giving a kind of default policy, uh, or then uses of the social pressure, social norms, and, and salience. Uh, just to give you a 10 kind of most common examples of these nudges that has been used, uh, one can uh, look at the Sunstein, which is uh, one of the founding fathers of the, of the nudge literature, and there you could see uh, kind of intuitively simplification, uh, increase of ease and convenience, you know, warnings, graphic um, reminders, and, and such as the kind of examples of, uh, of this. Now, uh, when we started this research project, uh, and we have a, 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 a another project that is, is uh, they're also called um, uh, uh, Carbon Nudge, um, which is uh, funded by the Strategic Research Council, we wanted to kind of look what could be the, the definition of climate nudge and, 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 and CP and Koi from University of Turku, which are part of our research uh, uh, group here, um, have published now an article about ethics of, 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 of climate nudges and, and, and there they actually define, and this has been adopted also in, in our research pro, uh, pro, uh, project that the climate nudge is an inten intentional modification of the choice architecture that aims to alter citizens' behavior towards climate-friendly action. Um, and um, we think that this is wide enough and then context specific enough uh, to kind of operationalize the, the nudges we are going uh, to make here. Um, I already actually visited this, that there is this kind of traditional external correcting and internal correcting, but uh, I don't want to go here deeper. Uh, I already talked about the, the new innovations versus the, the older policy relevant things. Um, there's the Carlson's article I, I recommend you to, to uh, read. Uh, I have this kind of like uh, some references in the end of the, uh, the presentation. But, but one of the kind of key things and the, one of the key uh, takeaways I would want for you to, to, uh, to uh, leave this presentation with is that now that we have gone into more to these nudges, it seems that, that the applicability, there is this problem that, um, which I failed to mention, is that, that there is a lot of different kind of thinking over what is actually a nudge and what can be nudged. And even you can, if you look at the literature, there is like a widespread different kind of is cognitive nuts and moral nuts and green nuts now and, and everything. And, and the boundaries and overlaps over these are not really clearly defined. But, but if we look really kind of critically and from the viewpoint of economic theory, uh, it seems to be the case that important cho choices are rarely nudgeable. Which means that if you really have a, an idea that you want to do something in a certain way, it's very difficult to change your view. So if you have, a, have an important choice and you are willing to look closely and um, to kind of compare different alternatives, then this is not an area for nudges. Uh, however, if there is uh, a, this kind of uncertainty uh, in, the, in a kind of like uh, you are not confident, then there might be a, a, a room for nudge and also if this kind of choice is not very important. Now, why, if we accept this, what does this tell about the possibility to use nudges in agriculture? 
is the decisions like carbon farming uh, something that you do inattentively and it's not like kind of you are very uncertain about it. We are not certain about it. So, so actually, uh, I'm not going to go o o now o to over this, uh, but just to say that there is actually kind of a, a framework when you can kind of look that if this kind of attentive, which is of course costly to you because you need to use your mental energy to think which is a good solution and, 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 and what are the costs and benefits between different, uh, different decisions, if that cost uh, is uh, too high in comparable to this kind of inattentive uh, decision where you kind of don't use a lot of your mental energy, but then you take the probability that you might not get to the optimal solution, uh, then this kind of inattentive thing could be the way forward with you, and then you could actually do some nudging there. I'm also going to skip over this really nice math stuff here. However, uh, there is a, a logic here, and these are the two bold ones down there, which is the, expect, the change in expected utility, and then this kind of a change in a non-utility uh, uh, kind of uh, choice framework. Uh, why uh, this is important, uh, and why it so much reflects into this kind of decision tree, I was um, uh, showing to you is that in order to operationalize, in order to study these notches, we actually need to put additional layer on the traditional economic utility maximi maximizing framework. So we need to kind of think that there is some kind of ex ante and ex post decision um, uh, making and this notch then can kind of affect uh, the ex ante decision making probabilities or the framework, but it can't really get and do uh, changes in the kind of traditional utility maximization uh, calculation that we assume everybody of you are doing. Why this is also important in the context of agriculture is that agriculture is a profit making activity, isn't it? You are, you are a farmer, you are trying to kind of make ends meet and, 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 and be like a, a, an entrepreneur. And in that sense also, it might be a little bit questionable whether this kind of a nudging framework actually is something that you can kind of take into account when the, your, your focus in the traditional sense is in this profit making. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm trying to be positive here. So, so there is certainly an area that that you can kind of, even in this kind of framework, uh, whoa, uh, even in this kind of framework, uh, you can nudge. And these are the, the the if you have this kind of confidence and importance, then you can have this kind of uh, inattentive, and then also this kind of un where you don't have a confidence to make the decisions where you can actually uh, actually um, affect the behavior of a, of a farmer also. Uh, one also forgets usually, one thinks easily uh, that these notches are free and they are more, uh, they are cheaper alternative to taxes or regulation, but uh, we can see that of course there is also implementation and enforcement costs which sometimes can be quite high, depending on the notch that we can use. And then, of course, if we have uh, this kind of big OVN tax system that we correct these externalities that are mani usually manifested, then there can be a little room for these notches. Uh, so, so one shouldn't look these in isolation, but one should take them into account when having this overall uh, overall um, uh, view of the of the different policy instruments. I give here some of the the agricultural notches that have been um, enacted and researched. There is usually a kind of like comparison between traditional policy instruments, uh, like you know, uh, taxes versus nudging, 
there is this informational nudges and the distribution. And then a lot of these agricultural related nudges have to do with, with uh, giving information about your colleague farmers or nearby farmers and what kind of choices have they made. Uh, so please uh, visit them if you and, and look at what, what has there been done. I talked about the criticism, and indeed there has been now a, 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 a strong criticism that has risen, now that actually the results from these nudge experiments have been uh, recorded and have been, uh, you know, been open to kind of critical scrutiny. And actually the most kind of d uh, damaging is uh, the, the, in this newest, uh, this year's econometrica, which is like par excellence, uh, the, the most kind of highly ranked uh, uh, economic journal, uh, they actually compared these uh, random control trials in uh, 126 uh, different things and also two United States nudge units. And, what the results were in these uh, these uh, these tests uh, were had an effect of close to 10 percent, but when they were done in the field, the the effects really plummeted, and and there can be this kind of Hawthorne effect where the, you know when you know that you are being studied, you act accordingly, and then when it comes like uh, your way of kind of daily uh, behavior, the effect disappears. And, and then there can be a problem of publication biases uh, and, and just kind of giving the positive, uh, positive, uh, um, positive results. So there is criticism. Uh, there is a kind of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, this kind of reduction on the kind of uh, um, uh, the thought of where this can be used. But this doesn't, however, uh, you know, make this redundant. I think it makes it more interesting and more relevant. Why? Because now we can take all this fashion and fad away and actually really look what is the role of this kind of nudging within the kind of policy uh, instrument and, and especially in, in agriculture. Uh, so the questions are, you know, whether these decisions are, are, are relevant, uh, what is kind of the interplay uh, how does this profit motive that is inherent here, how does that affect? And, and what is the role of taxes, especially like Picuvian taxes, uh, and uh, the correction of the biases inherent there? Can nudges be complements or substitutes? And, and how to kind of actually measure the, the true costs of these nudges that many cases seem to be forgotten? And how to take care of that, that these policy uh, uh, experiments that show very strong results, how can they be mitigated or changed so that policy relevance still uh, is in force when the normal farmers go there in the field and are supposed to do their daily chores. So I want to thank you for this kind of a quick uh, run through of the nudging. Uh, I hope it was illuminating and I'm more than happy to and, so, and of course, debate uh, about this matter. Thanks. Thank you, Oli Pekka. Very interesting topic, this nudging, and very interesting to hear about the pros and cons and where it can be used and where it cannot be used or <laughs> where it's not that suitable. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, if, if any, from the audience. A bit different topic. Don't hesitate to ask. This was not uh, not that similar uh, for the previous topic. There we go. <coughs> uh. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Irene Kuhmonen from the University of Jyväskylä. Is it possible to nudge companies? I know this was about farmers, but you know we have lots of companies in the food sector as well. So is it possible to use this on company level decision making? 
that, that is excellent question. Now we have in this Tuima project also this kind of like uh, uh, like um, management of Nazi's uh, work package, uh, which is led by Iro Jussila from the University of, of uh, Lappeenranta and Lahti. And there we try to engage actually uh, communi- uh, counties, uh, uh, municipalities, sorry, uh, municipalities, uh, and how they could kind of support these things. But uh, there comes even more strong, I think, this kind of idea, what, are, what is the purpose of the companies and, and uh, how you can kind of steer the decision making. We, 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 we definitely are going further from the, uh, from the, the kind of like uh, uh, the purview of economics to more kind of like different uh, social science uh, type of uh, activity if we want to study that. I would say that it, it poses uh, problems, but of course we can nudge the shareholders <laughs> to put kind of pressure on the companies perhaps or, or like that. So, so, but very, very good question, yeah. Thank you. Any more one short question? Oh, we have one. Pretty simple question. Can you give an example of what a nudge would look like in relation to farmers? Like, what's a good example of this? Because I'm having difficulty conceptualizing what a nudge would look like. Okay. Um, we are we are in this project. We are we are doing uh, informational nudge, uh, where we uh, send uh, info letters to farmers, and we tell what the neighboring farmers how kind of climate wise decisions have they made and how much they have been able to reduce uh, carbon emissions and we will then also have a, a, a group that doesn't get this information and then we will look actually uh, for the, the decisions uh, that um, uh, from ProAgria uh, database uh, whether they have done this kind of similar choices. So we will try to kind of uh, uh, facilitate. Then the other other one which we are doing uh, in this uh, this other project, uh, and that concerns actually the forests. Uh, we are trying to promote uh, ash uh, cultivation, uh, also by kind of like giving information about the, the feedback, uh, and also framing these kind of um, letters highlighting different aspects. Uh, for, 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 for that. So th- that those would be an ex- examples uh, of the things we are trying to now measure. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Olli Pekka, once more. So I think it's time to end this session and uh, thank you to all our speakers, all our great speakers. I think we have learned a lot about soil sequestration and carbon farming from very different perspectives, from the soil and from the farmer's side and from the practices and and the monitoring and verification. So very interesting afternoon. Uh, Thank you also to the audience for good questions and, and being active. And thank you all.